Welcome everybody to my podcast, Big Little Small Talk. I'm Megan O'Hara Sullivan and I love to talk, but I also love to listen. If you're new here, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome along, listeners, to Big Little Small Talk, that segment where we go out and talk to someone interesting in the community. And I know that I always say that I've got someone interesting, but today I have got someone really, really interesting, and his name is Rick Chevelle Carlson. And a lot of you will know him from Rick's Flicks fame, which we will talk about a little bit later on. But just before we started the interview today, Rick was, has been working out at Jimba, and um, he was telling me a little bit about some of the history with the Chevelles and the Russells from Jimba. So welcome along, Rick, and thank you for being my guest today on Big Little Small Talk. Oh, great. Look, thanks, Megan. So tell me, you've been working out at Jimba just recently. Tell me the intersection of the Chevelles and the Russell family who own Jimba. Well, that's interesting because I don't know the, the actual uh, full details, but I do know that the, the Chevelles are related to the Russell family in some capacity in through marriage, but as a young uh, 20-year-old, my mum and her cousin went for a bit of a drive. They borrowed my grandfather's old jalopy and decided they'd go on a bit of a road trip, which included Queensland, dropping in to see family and friends along the way and seeing what free night's accommodation they could get. And one of the places that they stopped in was Jimba House, and they stayed there a night, and I've got these really lovely photographs from the mid-50s all in black and white of the homestead of what it looked like back then, the facade and so forth. And so when I was there the other night waiting at this uh, function for David Russell for a special function out there, I mentioned to him that I've got these photos so I'll have to swing them his way. Yes, it's such a fantastic place, Jimbo. I think I've mentioned to the listeners before that my husband and I went on a private tour there and they are encouraging that, that you can go out and book into these tours and there's nothing off limit at Jimbo. You can see all of the rooms in the house and see it all in its former glory so it is something that I would recommend that everyone tries to do absolutely so I wanted to actually start off Rick by talking about your mum Sue because she's an interesting person she's had an interesting upbringing and it seems to me that your mum dedicated her life I don't know whether that's a fair assessment to making the memory of her parents, solidifying it in history and recording it. Was that a fair thing to say? Tell me about your mum. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was certainly a fair chunk of it. It certainly wasn't uh, the whole of of what my mother was like. She uh, she had many facets to her, apart from being a a terrific mother, but she had quite a, a, a deep faith as well. And I think it was that that really helped her through a lot of the trials throughout her life. Uh, we left Sydney in 77 after my parents' uh, marriage uh, broke up and we moved all the way up here, which seems a long way, but my great aunt Jean Chevelle, which was Charles Chevelle's sister, who lived in Stanthorpe and who we visited on many occasions over school holidays, said that Toowoomba was a great place to move to, schools, medical, etc., close to Brisbane, and of course also close to Stanthorpe as well. So Toowoomba became our home in the late 70s. Okay. So your mother was 29, I gather, when she got married? That's correct, yes. Right. And before that, tell me about your mother's life with her parents. Well, I mean, amazing. I mean, she had a very, very full life uh, travelling around with my grandparents, uh, being on film sets, on reconnaissance trips, and even just being at home and watching the dynamics of my grandparents and, you know, around the dinner table at night and discussing what happened that day on set with the filming and what was working and what wasn't working. And so I think my mother became the perfect candidate to write articles and books about my grandparents because she could see the positives and the negatives and and what worked and and what was the hardships and and the difficulties. And so she became a, a true wordsmith in that sense. And she really felt that the stories that not really many people knew about the intricacies of my grandparents' Uh, were actually being told so she felt that it was her job to be able to sort of relay that on to you know another generation and 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 she spent you know years uh, researching which I helped her when I could I'd go down to Sydney or or Melbourne and and do a lot of research and scavenged and found posters and and photographs and we were able to sort of put together a lot of the the pieces in the jigsaw puzzle and uh, and it became the a wonderful, wonderful sort of partnership in that sense, um, not only, you know, mother and son, but just good friends, you know, yeah. and, and really good mates. And we really were able to sort of come up with a few uh, outcomes. Right. Because I didn't know, and I don't know that the listeners would know, 
Your grandparents are Charles and Elsa Chevelle, really iconic people within the Australian film industry. Mm. Most famous, is it fair to say, for the movie Jeddah? Yes, I think amongst so. Amongst other Yes, certainly. I mean, one. certainly even going back before then, but I mean, certainly Jeddah is the film that uh, I think people remember the most. Uh, it's the most iconic in the sense that, it, you know, it was Australia's first uh, feature film in colour, uh, the first film to uh, incorporate Aboriginal actors in the lead role for the very first time. And really, it was the story... It actually gave the Aboriginal people a voice and, and spoke more about their mythology. And, 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 and I think up until then, that really wasn't uh, considered or, or respected. And so I think that's, it's, it's had that longevity. But certainly before that, you know, he, he certainly uh, had benchmarks and he certainly was able to, with each film, get better with his craft. Mm-hmm. So let's just stay on Jeddah for a little bit longer because there is mm. so much to be read about it and I, I know that I have seen it. But tell me the story of Jeddah. What was the premise and was it a, was it a true story? Well, with Jeddah it's interesting because up until then it was probably after one of my grandparents' trips to America and especially Hollywood that uh, I think it was at the time and it would have been after Sons of Matthew and he would have been probably in Hollywood and one I think it was a Time reporter, uh, Time magazine reporter mentioned that you know that that really no one had ever seen any stories about our own indigenous people here in Australia and that sort of gave my grandfather a bit of a spark and it got him on that track of thinking that uh, yes that could be a fascinating story and something that really he could actually really massage into something really terrific and so he went on this uh, amazing reconnaissance trip with my grandmother and my mother and uh, they spent many many weeks up in the top end and through the territory and western queensland talking to locals hearing their stories listening finding out what was happening the history of the area and really moulded three stories that they felt were the landmark stories that they had gathered over over their experience in their reconnaissance trip. And they wove those three stories together. And, you know, one was the story of Nimaluk, who was a, a renegade um, Aboriginal man who was actually abducting half-caste girls, taking them into the bush, raping them and leaving them for dead. And this was this was fact. And, this, and, and the police were after him at the time. And he was a real warrior he was a real renegade and that was one big story and then there was the story of on walkabout where uh, an aboriginal baby was left after mother had died during childbirth and then there's also the story of the station properties wife had lost her child during childbirth and so my grandfather wove these three stories together and and that's what we see today with Jeddah. I know you mentioned all the firsts before but I did read too that Jeddah was the first film to be nominated for a Khan in Khan for a Palm Door Award. That's right I did forget that and uh, I was very fortunate back in 2000 and 15 to actually do a 60th anniversary screening at the Cannes Film Festival, right. uh, which was uh, a great honour for me to do that. And yes, yeah, so it was nominated for the Palm Door Award. It, it didn't win. I think it was Marty that year with uh, Ernest Bergnine that uh, that that won the the Palm Door Award. But in the last few years, uh, a colleague of mine down in Melbourne actually spoke to one of the head representatives at Cannes um, who was actually there for the screening back in 55 and he mentioned that uh, it was a very poor subtitling and it was very very hard to understand the premise and, and the story and what was going on so it's quite possible that it might have done better if the translation and the subtitling had been better. Okay yeah mm. you were robbed of course mm. it was robbed. But That's I can right. tell you that the, the new translation that was done when I went there in uh, 2015 was fantastic and it was a really, really terrific uh, um, transfer. So you were there with the likes of David Stratton and all of the rest of them and all these film aficionados who just love film and they knew all about Jeddah, did they, and where it fitted into the context well, yes and no. I mean, to so Australian you, so film? You've got the, you've got the Cannes Film Festival and underneath that you've got the sub-festivals that run during the, the Cannes Festival and one was the Antipodes uh, uh, Film Festival that is basically Australian and New Zealand films um, that uh, are shown during the festival. Mm-hmm. And, and people there 
respect and revere Jeddah for its place in, in Australian history? Well, I hope so. I hope so. That year, a lot of other Australian films were shown. I can't remember. I think maybe it was The Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith, and but also a lot of mainly uh, contemporary current release films but uh, this sort of fitted into that nostalgic section but the people who went loved it and they really enjoyed it and I had my own French uh, translator with me uh, Bernard Borry uh, and he uh, did a wonderful job at uh, being able to relay my um, expressions and thoughts and stories about Jeddah to to the audience which always is wonderful having that Q&A it really fleshes everything out right it's great I did read that you said before that he was really ahead of his time Charles and Elsa and I did read that someone said after the making of that film that uh, he would never make another film again because the sort of the social commentary was that it was sort of too experimental or too um, giving giving indigenous people an agency that they didn't deserve or something like oh, that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. He was given a lot of uh, flack from a lot of uh, his peers and certainly from the prime minister at the time, which was uh, Robert Menzies. He was scathing of of the fact that he was, uh, and I won't go into the the actual wording that he put, but he was scathing of the fact that my grandfather was going to be using. Aboriginal people in the lead role, so he uh, he got a lot of flack. But though I must admit that he did end up getting a fuel allowance and uh, permits to be able to go into Arnhem Land and so forth. So that was, I guess, the government's support for my grandfather with Jeddah. But he, you know, he did get a lot of criticism from a lot of his peers and industry and technicians and so forth. And I'm fairly certain that uh, there were a lot of people that really didn't want uh, Jeddah to be made and. Uh, of course, his company back in Australia, which was Charles Chevelle's Charles Chevelle Productions back in Sydney, that was basically engineered to fail. So there were people sort of working, you know, behind the scenes, working at um, corrupting his company while he was out making making the film. Wow! You know. So that was in nineteen fifty five. Fifty Doesn't... well, yeah, fifty five, fifty six. Doesn't mm. seem that long ago. No. Tell me about the premiere up in Darwin. And I read somewhere that because of the heat, the extreme heat, that they couldn't keep the reels just in a normal temperature. They had to store them in the local butcher shop overnight. Is that true? Oh, well, no, this is not. So this is actually with the filming. Yeah, that's right, with the actual filming of the film. So on location, what would happen would be that... Uh, and this. It's very hard for people to understand this day because we're so used to picking up a mobile phone, shooting something and seeing it instantaneously and then being able to send it on to someone, (laughs) put it up onto platforms and so forth. But, you know, my grandfather was using 35mm film in, you know, sometimes 50 degree heat and so they actually had to have a lot of Indigenous people and also the crew keeping the camera uh, cool with palm fronds and keeping it constantly fanned and then once that film was taken out of the uh, camera it was put into a rock crevice or a, a very cool area with wet hessian over the top to keep that cool and then when nightfall came that was then put in a butcher's truck, taken to Darwin, loaded onto the plane and then sent to England because we didn't have any colour laboratories back then in Australia and so it went to Denham Laboratories in England and then of course that film had to be processed and then weeks later my grandfather would get a telegram in the middle of nowhere saying reel 2, okay, reel 4, no good and so then if it was no good he'd have to reshoot that and in fact actually the first seven weeks of filming and you've got to remember this is seven weeks of filming were all lost due to the fact that the young camera assistant threaded the film back to front through the camera so you can understand he lost his job and was sent back to Sydney straight away but you know today if a film company lost seven weeks that's phenomenal and so apart from the film stock they had to then travel back over hundreds and hundreds of kilometers back to that location set up again reshoot all that and and so it's amazing the film actually got made in the first place so your mother was living what what age would your mother have been then she was living 
and what presumably... Oh, she would have been in her mid-twenties. Oh, she was time. an adult. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, so she was in her mid-twenties. Uh, she was in Sydney, and I think she did, uh, apart from the reconnaissance trip, I think on one or two occasions, she, she did manage to travel up on school holidays for a couple of the shoots and so forth, but wasn't up there for the for the whole mm. extent of the making of Jeddah. Uh, and you, your grandparents, where were they staying when they were filming? Would they have been camped on site? Yes, or? absolutely, absolutely. Uh, my grandfather, you know, insisted on that. In fact, actually, if they were in the middle of nowhere, that's not they really couldn't stay anywhere. And it's a, a little bit like uh, film production companies today. They've got their own trailers and their own... Uh, um, campsites and they, they set up their makeshift tent cities wherever they are unless they're you know close to a town or something like that so it, that's exactly what they do they'd set up tents and um, set up all their equipment and so forth but I mean you can understand that the the crew was a very small crew it only consisted really of uh, my grandparents the actors and and whatever the locals they could get to come in and, and help and so forth you know so it was a very very small unit you can't imagine it would have been so hot <laughs> absolutely oh yes you know no I I want to um I want to go off talking specifically about Jeddah in a second but you gave me a little teaser or you said something over oh, that I've got to tell you the real story what did you say earlier oh well it's just it's interesting because you know the fact that you know Jeddah got made in the first place because of its uh, its context of of the mid 50s you know it's very controversial for the day but uh, it wasn't only really until a few years before my mother passed away uh, she passed away in 2013, but it was a few years before that that uh, she found uh, the original script for Jeddah, the one that actually didn't get made. And it was quite an eye-opener for my mum because uh, she mentioned in there that there, there were a lot of things um, that my grandfather had that uh, obviously were, were too way out for um, anyone to accept uh, it went more into the the mysticism and the mythology of of the Aboriginal people and their and and their beliefs and and their dream time, but also um, in a couple of scenes it was interesting because there was one scene in which uh, the um, the police come looking for Marbuck, who had abducted Jeddah, and they'd come to the station, and uh, within the script it has all the women and children running away into the bush. And of course, the station owner comes out and says, "Look what you've done! Now they, they thought you were coming to come take their children away, and that would have been just too far out, you know." And so I think that had to be scrubbed. That's obviously that that you know that was too politically uh, sensitive at the time right. when that was actually happening. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it's interesting. So I mean, my my grandfather really had a respect for. Uh, the Aboriginal people and, and really wanted to tell their story and it's, it'd be interesting to see if uh, my grandfather had been given carte blanche and to be able to absolutely make the film he really wanted to mm-hmm. would have been maybe mm-hmm. totally different. Was he modifying the story because of sponsors? Or? Possibly, yeah. I just don't think. I mean, he certainly had um, people, you know, who were investing in his company, and I just don't think he would have been able to have made the film, you know. But also, as I said, you know, there was a lot of pressure from the government, you know, and not like today, you know. I mean, he was he was the true independent filmmaker of of, of the day, you know. I mean, there were other filmmakers, you know, especially Kenji Hall, you know, in Australia. But he was a he was definitely a company man, and he. You know, he made films to make money, whereas my grandfather didn't really make films to make money, though he he needed to make money to make the next film, but he made films because he loved films and he wanted to present the Australian landscape and our stories, not only to Australia, but to the rest of the world. And and that was his love. And and so he was on a different mission altogether. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. I did read about this Kenji Hall and how there was this kind of long-standing rivalry between... But a friendly rivalry. A friendly rivalry. And and I think in many ways, when, when that happens is, each one then strives to do better. They're trying to outdo each other. And so it actually becomes a healthy rivalry. Mm-hmm. So he was a contemporary of your grandfather's? At the same time, yeah. yeah they were both yeah. running at the same time. Kenji Hall owned the, the very well-known uh, Cine Sound Studios in Bondi Junction in Sydney. And uh, he, um, yeah, he, he, he was able to be able to shoot all his films on location right there at the studios. He did all the Cine Sound newsreels of the day. And so... He was making a profit. You know, he had the he had the new newsreels. They were making their money. That was a staple of the day. And then he was churning out a lot of films. And so he 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 turned out a lot more films than my grandfather. But my grandfather was more about having pieces in history. 
So tell me about, though, the famous uh, line where, was it your grandfather, Charles, said to him, well, mate, we know what you do. You you put in five or six extra scenes with the nudity or whatever. Can you... Oh, look, it's interesting because I think um, there was always the censors of the day, you know, even in America, you know, even in Hollywood, they had their censors. And in America, that sort of finished in uh, a lot of the films that they were making up until 1934. They could pretty much get away with anything. And when you look at a lot of the early, what they call pre-code films in, in, in America, you've got all these films that really touch on weird and wonderful things that uh, even today you think, how did they get away with that? But then this production code came in in 34 called the Hayes Code, which basically was sort of, you know, the undermining of the uh, fabric of the American nation and, we're, and so they had to clean it up. And so then it was very difficult for filmmakers to touch on certain subjects, so they had to sort of skate around it either with dialogue or innuendo and so forth. But certainly with my grandfather, he always said that it was funny because Kenji Hall said, you know, how did you get away with all those... Tahitian nude scenes in the wake of the bounty. And he said, I'll let you on to a little bit of a secret. He said, Ken, he said, I always shoot six scenes more than what I need because I know that the censors are going to cut three. And then he said, then I get the scenes I want. <laughs> so that, that's the secret. Yeah, for sure. So how did Charles and Elsa meet and how did they become so invested in their filmmaking? It's been unusual. Yeah, well, luxurious my grandmother had been, was born in Melbourne but lived in South Africa until the age of 20, came back to Australia and it was at the stage when my grandfather was making his second film, his second silent film, that was released in 1926 called Greenhide. And he was looking for a leading lady for his film. And my grandmother, who had been on the stage from a very, very young age, was playing at the Winter Garden in, in, in Brisbane. He went along and saw her there after the show, said, look, I, I, I'd like to um, audition you for a, for a movie. Um, can we meet for coffee? She never turned up for coffee. He tracked her down and said, look, you know, that's just not acceptable, you know, standing me up. And uh, he somehow convinced her to be in the film. And by the end of the picture, they were engaged to be married. Mm -hmm. uh, how had your grandfather became a filmmaker? What sort of upbringing yeah, had he Yeah, well, had? that's interesting because he, he grew up not very far from here, born in Warwick in 1897. Uh, then moved with his family around uh, 1900 down to the Fassifern Valley around Boonabo Desert. Harrisville was the little hub there. And uh, his father, Alan Chevelle, who was a military man and who his brother was the famed Harry Chevelle of the Light Horse, who led the expeditionary campaign during the First World War and is famous on the charge of Bathsheba. They had a property around Fassifern. And so from a very early age, he really wanted to study art and he had four brothers and one sister, and they all ended up doing different things. But from a very early age, he really wanted to study art. And, uh, and then as a young boy, he went down to Sydney at the disgust of his father, because I think his father wanted uh, the boys to take on the property and to take on the legacy in that sense. But uh, my grandfather went down to Sydney to study art and then met Snowy Baker. And, and you know, there's a story in itself, and I think there's a movie in itself, but Snowy Baker, was an amazing character. He was this all-round athlete, good at everything, physique to match. He was an Olympiad, he could do anything. And he had started dabbling in and started making um, a lot of silent films, the flickers, the flicks down in Sydney. And somehow my grandfather stumbled across what he was doing and was intrigued with this new medium of film and begged him to have him as, a, as an extra or as a horse handler because he was very good with horses you know my grandfather growing up on property he could ride bareback he was very skilled and managed to persuade uh, Snowy Baker to put him on as a as a as a rouseabout and a, a helping hand and eventually then when Snowy Baker went to Hollywood to then make more films he then hopped on the next ship and followed him over there and then spent quite a few years over there learning the craft before he came back to Australia. Fascinating story. And I think that's amazing too, because I mean, my grandfather would have been in Hollywood. He was there around, you know, 1923, and that's when it was all happening. Chaplin, Fairbanks, you know, Mary Pickford, it was all happening there. And he was there when it was all happening, was able to watch what was happening, watch the studio system. He was in quite a few films there, just playing, you know, extras and, and B-rolls and so forth, but also was watching what was happening, you know, within the studio and so forth, and then came back and with the ideas that he had and what he had 
had learnt there then set about making his first uh, silent film. Right, yes. Now, you mentioned it about his brother and um, the, the story of the Light Horseman, and that I wanted to ask you about that because your grandfather made 40,000 Horsemen, that was what it was called, yeah. the story of the Light Horseman, mm. and you said that um, he hassled that fellow into giving him a go, and I did read a story about someone that hassled your grandfather on a train and said, my son wants to get into making films. Can you tell that story? Look, I just I probably don't know that... A hundred percent, but it ended up being Damien Perra, the, 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 the very skilled wartime uh, cameraman and who uh, did all those wonderful films up around the Kokoda Trail and so forth and, uh, and won an Academy Award, I think, Front Run, I think it was called. So, uh, yes, um, obviously Damien Perra's uh, parents uh, had seen uh, my grandparents on, on the train and... and uh, and, and pestered him to, to, to give uh, Damien Power a go, which he did. He, um, when it came to 40,000 Horsemen, my, uh, my grandfather, um, especially for the, the charge scene, um, enlisted the top five cameramen of the time, including the famed uh, Frank Hurley, um, and uh, set about getting the best scenes for that charge scene, which he used as a teaser, to then get the funding to then make 40,000 Horsemen. Was that before or after Jeddah? What's the chronology? So 40,000 Horsemen was released in in 1940, so that's definitely before Mm Jeddah. And really, 40,000 Horsemen was the the, the film that really uh, put my grandfather's name on the map. It was a film that really, I think it came at the right time for the right person. You know, we were, we were, entering the, the Second World War, and even though this was about the First World War, you know, morale was down. Uh, and my grandfather was just a, a, um, an amazing, uh, had an amazing eye for finding raw talent. And he was able to pull together an amazing uh, crew that just worked. And the subject worked, and the timing was right, and it just beat all box office Returns. It it was like any major blockbuster that we might have seen, you know, here in Australia. Maybe not at the moment with uh, the way that uh, the industry is at the moment. But if you can remember some of the the films in Australia that uh, really, you know, went gangbusters, this was it. And uh, apparently, you know, people were lined up around the block for weeks, you know, for eight weeks trying to see the film. So it was just it it did incredibly well, and it not only did incredibly well in Australia, but it uh, it did very well internationally. And my grandfather had a very good. Uh, um, he was very good at uh, promoting himself and and his films, and he had a, a lot of luck at getting a lot of his films distributed internationally. Right. And so, yeah. And I would mm. imagine that um, he might have launched the career of a few famous Australian oh, actors. Absolutely, you know, Errol Flynn, Peter Finch, Chips Rafferty, Michael Pate. I mean, that's just uh, you know, and 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 certainly gave a lot of technicians work that then they were then able to then, you know, then move on into television later on, you know. And so a lot of when the film industry bottomed out in the 50s and and Australia was embracing uh, the new world of uh, television, a lot of those technicians that had worked in the in the film industry then just navigated straight to television, which my grandfather did because after Jeddah, you know, the industry totally bottomed out and there was no funding there was no interest no support for the Australian film industry in fact actually in one of my grandmother's oral histories back in the 70s she actually mentions that there were a a few people especially one person within the government that actually wanted the Australian industry to fail they didn't want it to to fail because you know it it was big money and at that stage America had, well, from a very early period back in, in, when, when we were making so many more films in Australia than anywhere else in the world, we were making more films than anyone, and there's records for that. But America saw the potential from a very early age of the um, influence that film had and the, the propaganda nature and, and, and the money as well. And so they came into Australia and bought up all the cinema chains and so then, the, the, then there was a block booking of, of American content. And so then you, you can go into the history of this, but there was a, an, a, basically a, an inquiry into, into trying to change so that it would be a quota. Mm. 
Right. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's very interesting, but certainly, you know, uh, Horseman, you know, was a fantastic film and, and it really was a feather in the cap for my, my grandfather. But, uh, yes, no, my grandfather launched the careers of, of many people. He had a very, very keen eye, as I said, for raw talent and being able to then draw that talent out of them. You know, and it's interesting with, with if, for some of the older listeners that might know anything about Chips Rafferty, but that was interesting because originally his name was... George William Pilbeam Goffage. And my grandfather said, that's just not going to be the right sort of name for the screen. And so I sat around the, the table one late night and it was going on and on. And my grandfather was saying, well, you know, you must have had a nickname in school. He said, well, they used to call me Chip, you know, like Chip off the old block, that sort of thing, like my grandfather. Like my father, he said, because I looked a little bit like him. And he said, oh, that's a start. That's, that's not so bad. And it kept going on. And after a while, you know, Chips Rafferty got very, very frustrated. He said, that's it. He said, I'm, I'm over this. this is, it's all Rafferty's rules anyway. And that's when my grandfather went, right, that's it. That's what we're going to use. And, and it stayed with him for the rest of his life, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, incredible. I'm so sure many there's stories. many more stories. Many exactly. more stories. He was Can a very just... highly intelligent person too, right. Chips Rafferty. He always played the laconic, uh, joking, um, fun-loving Australian, but actually he was a very, very well-educated, very, very smart person. Mm-hmm. You said you started to say, Rick, about your father, your grandfather, Charles, transitioning mm. into television. What happened there? How did he go with that? Was he able to make that transition? It was very and... fortunate because after uh, Jeddah... I think it would have been, I think it was when he was in the UK and they were wrapping up everything in the UK with all the post-production work and, and uh, in the, in, as, as I said, in Denim Laboratories. And it was there that probably there another reporter or someone, I know I think it was someone from the BBC, spoke to my grandfather and said that they loved the colour work and, and they loved... Um, the work that had been done with Jeddah. And at that time, there was a husband-wife um, filmmaking couple that were travelling around Africa and so forth called um, Armand and Michaela Dennis. And they were doing this wonderful, these wonderful series for the BBC on travel expos through Africa and, you know, hunting elephants and rhinos and, and, and you know, going right into the, into the bush of, of Africa. And so uh, they approached my grandparents and said would you do the same and I think my grandfather felt this is a lifeline because he knew that there wasn't much support for the industry and there was no funding and it was really bottoming out and I think it was only really two films that were made in Australia uh, the year of Jeddah and then really nothing after that and so he he took that lifeline and you know the BBC provided all this great camera equipment uh, and uh, yeah, and the rest is history. He ended up making 13 half-hour documentaries for the BBC that all touch on different parts of um, Australian life. One was on the Royal Flying Doctor Service. One was on the GAN, the School of the Air, um, Victoria River Downs, the Snowy Hydro Scheme that was happening, uranium mining. So, And no one's seen this. It's quite amazing. And there's a story to that which is quite amazing as well. But... Uh, I've had this all totally restored by the film archives. So the National Film and Sound Archives down in Canberra have restored all of these and transferred these all, which is wonderful. But there had been... My mother and I had had a bit of a... I guess an idea that we really wanted to see a contemporary day documentary showing what's happened in Australia in the last 60 years. I mean, this is all this was all shot in colour in the mid-50s, you know, 20 years before the Leyland Brothers... And it's really iconic uh, stuff. It's it's amazing, and and we felt that it would be wonderful to have a contemporary documentary going back and showing how Australia's changed. In some ways, Australia hasn't changed, but looking at the landscape, the people, and everything over a sixty-year period, and but using that wonderful colour footage. And I've had some interest by you know a, a few different um, companies in regards to that idea and that topic and so that made me think well if we're going to be using any sort of footage to use in a documentary we want to we want to get the best materials possible so I got in contact with the British Film Institute and also the BBC in England and all of the material was scrapped back in the in the 60s along with 
a lot of other programs and I had one of the representatives get in contact and they said it was the thing of the day and they said there's a lot of the content from the BBC that is no more because it was thrown out and I think they had one episode in black and white on 16 millimeter and that was it. The National Film and Sound Archive had a lot of material but it was all black and white and we had our own colour set and it was the only colour set that we knew of and my grandparents had bought that for their own private, I guess like you would with a, with a Blu-ray or a DVD, they bought that as their own private uh, you know, resource material. And so some years ago I sent that down to the film and sound icons thinking, well there's no need for me to have this in my garage up here in Toowoomba. And then it wasn't until actually that I made some inquiries that I realised that that was the only known colour source of this um, of this amazing documentary series. So I had the, the National Film and Sound Archives go about uh, digitising and restoring and and, uh, and luckily it was a very good uh, set of prints to begin with so they, they got back to me and said it was a was a really good process anyway because they were really good prints. So hopefully something will come of that one day. That sounds incredible. Yeah, when amazing. you're telling that story, I was thinking, I hope you got someone to sign for them when they you know, were delivered down there. Yeah, oh, know? no, it's... it's <laughs> they metaphorically. Went, oh, no, no, I think they went back. I think they must have gone down there. Possibly we sent them down there maybe... Oh, maybe it might have been the mid-90s, maybe. I think they went down there. So it's a while ago now they went down there. But they've been sitting there ever since up until a few years ago when I realised that that was the only known mm. colour set. And uh, it's wonderful, you mm. know, what they've done with it. Well, you hear all those stories about the all of those countdown episodes and mm. um, all of that other stuff from the ABC, yep. that that was all cleared out and mm. even Wake in Fright, that there was only one version of it, wasn't yeah. there? That, but now um, that's been fully yeah. restored, which is amazing because yeah. I remember when I was doing my uh, Rick's Flick screenings some years ago and it was a film that I wanted to screen but it was on the list of lost films because it was incomplete And uh, but now it's been fully restored so... That's wonderful. Well, look, that's a perfect segue because I wanted to go on to Rick's Flicks. Tell me about how you started that and what, what was that and is that now? Yeah, it's interesting because Rick's Flicks has, has always had a bit of a following and it's got its own sort of legend in some way, which is it's amazing after all these years, you know, because I was working at the time at uh, what was then the Railway Square Cafe, which is now Autumn, on Railway Street. And they had that lovely gallery space up, up, up top, which they used for functions and exhibitions and so forth. And I had some 16mm projectors at home. And I, 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 even before then, I used to run film through the projectors and have movie nights, you know, and have people round and so forth, using what film I already had, probably screening some of my grandfather's films. But then also I had some cartoons and a few things like that. And I, and I just jokingly said, oh, you know, we should put on some movie nights upstairs. And I said, I could bring my projectors along and... Put some put some films on, and they said, "Well, why don't you do it?" And I said, "Yeah." So we we did that, and uh, and and just out of that was born Rick's Flicks, and uh, I did that for a year there, and it just just from day one it just took off, and it was an amazing amazing venture, which then led to taking over the the rear section of the old RSL building in Toowoomba and and running that for about eight years, and that was an amazing enterprise. Lost all my money with it, but that's okay. And uh, can we hear some more about oh, that? Oh, it's, it's 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 okay. I'm I'm, I'm over the, uh, the the trauma now. But uh, at the time, I um, I really felt driven to create something very very special, which I did. And those who remember the Icon Cinema, which I called it, which was at the rear section of the old RSL building, which had been abandoned for for many many years. About seven or eight years had been abandoned. And I, I probably won't go into the, the politics behind that because it's, it's not very good. But anyway, uh, I took over that rear space and I took out a mortgage on my home to build uh, a cinema, which I did. I built this 100-seat art house cinema with full projection system in a projection box up in the loft. I had 35mm projection, 16mm projection, digital and then I had a, a six metre screen which I had masking so I could then do cinemascope, widescreen, four by three, which is called Academy Ratio, the old uh, box. And I built a, uh, it had the old commercial kitchen there, so I went about getting that reinstated and going through all the compliance. And I had the commercial kitchen reinstated so I could serve meals. I then got a liquor license 
the liquor license reinstated for the bar, built a whole brand new bar and foyer. So it was people come in, have a, um, a glass of wine, a coffee, a meal, and then go in and watch the movie. It was all Art Deco. I had amazing furniture. I travelled all throughout Queensland buying up old cinema seats and furniture and light fittings. And it was just, it was, it was a dream. It was something that was very special to me and something which I wanted to uh, share with Toowoomba. And in fact, I, I used to have a lot of people coming up from Melbourne going, wow, this is amazing. This, this should be in Melbourne. And in fact, actually, I had Charles Woolley from 60 Minutes. Of those who remember, Charles Woolley came up going, what are you doing in Toowoomba? He just couldn't believe it. And he came and had a drink at the bar. And it was, it was very something very special, something that you would have seen hidden away in Melbourne. And with the types of movies I was showing, I mean, apart from the classics, which is where Rick's Flicks was born, because I, I've always been with the Rick's Flicks Film Society, I always uh, concentrated on classic Hollywood movies from the early 1930s to the late 1950s, that classic period where amazing films were being made. But then within the last few years, I really branched out and started showing current release art house films, world cinema and so forth. And then also used the space for live functions, for jazz nights, rock nights, uh, and it became a, a little bit of a hub for people to then hire out to use for live performance or cinema and a lot of community groups that otherwise couldn't afford some of the larger complexes here in Toowoomba could then afford to do fundraising nights and have special uh, I used to do birthday parties and put on films for you know for groups and it was just incredible it was wonderful and so that ran from 2003 to uh, late 2009 when I had to shut everything down and clear everything out and, and sell everything off and there wasn't much that I was able to um, keep I had to because I, I had you know you've got a whole cinema worth of furniture and equipment and I couldn't store that so I had to basically just get rid of it and people just came in and would buy a seat or buy you know it was just heartbreaking it really was you know and it took many many years to get over that the the anger and and the hurt and um and the loss of of all of that but over the years um I've resurrected Rick's Flicks every now and again for certain periods of time and and just going back not so long ago from about August to December down at inbound down at the railway station we had a really successful few months showing movies down there and we did a wonderful two course dinner and movie night and just shows that that the name is still there because to be honest I didn't really do too much promotion the, the word just got out and before I knew it you know Chinese whispers everyone was was talking about Rick's Flicks and they uh, we, we booked out the first two nights in a row and, and not that we did a third night but we could have easily done a third night because people just couldn't get in it was well, amazing. I, think I told so. you I work with a lady who had been and just she loved it and she thought it was fantastic her and her husband had had mm. dinner there and watched the film what was the film did you just have the one film? Yeah so it was basically it was it, it, you know each month I'd put on the one film but I'd, I'd replicate that two nights in a row mm -hmm. and if we get this happening again hopefully in the next few months which is what I'm hoping uh, we'll hopefully look at doing maybe you know a, a few nights in a row because I think we could easily um, fill three nights mm -hmm. and so it would start off where people would come along have a have a drink at the bar sit down mains would come out mains would get cleared away I'd present the film and we'd watch half the film and then when intermission arrived dessert would come out so it was just a really terrific evening that flowed so well okay well did you have Q&A at the end I didn't have a Q&A at the end but uh, well I shouldn't say that I, I always would say I would always ask people if they if they had any questions which but I, it wasn't actually more sort of um, a formalized Q&A but I would always at the end of the of the evening ask people if there were any questions about the film or anything that they wanted to know and we'd have a bit of a talk at the end but I would always give away most of the trivia anyway before um, before the film because I'd present the film give people a bit of a a bit of a, a glimpse into the film without giving too much away of the of the story because that always wrecks it but would give people a little bit of and then halfway through um, or probably at the end of the night then I'd do a little bit more of a, a conclude with some of the juicy bits that I couldn't tell people in the beginning because it would have wrecked the film. So, Sounds wonderful. Yeah. I hope, I, I am looking forward to seeing the resurrection of it. Um, so it's just been COVID and that yes, sort of interfered with all definitely. of that? Yes, definitely. So I think just, just having confidence in, in going out and so forth. So uh, I think we're, we're getting close to, to rekindling that again. But, uh, 
but uh, yeah, look, it's, uh, it's, it's sometimes you just need to have a little bit of a break for a while before you resurrect that again. And I think it's just, it was just a period where I think I need to pull back for a while while everything needed to sort of stabilise a bit. Okay. Have you been following the Nomad Pictures guys here? Oh, yes. No, uh, Stephen's a good friend of mine and I really support him 100% even though I don't get a chance to go to all the films and he's doing a, a fantastic job and, uh, you know, kudos to him, you know. For sure. We mm. saw Licorice Pizza the other day. Yes, I, I, I was wonderful. working and I really wanted to go and see that but uh, but I saw some great films last year that he put on there yeah, and so we yeah. tend to sort of... Uh, collaborate in that way in regards to you know supporting each other and and uh, he's doing a great job it's wonderful yeah, yeah. and, and the, the, it's always seems to be sold out anyway so i think there's a lot of film buffs in toowoomba who would be waiting for you to bring back your yeah Rick's definitely Flicks, well, yeah. it's the great thing about that because i mean I, I'm, I'm not trying to be anything more than what i am and there's certainly people that classic cinema is not their thing and that's perfectly fine but for the people who love it and want to pull back and and go off into a different time and place for one night it's fantastic and it's a lot of fun and I think if you can combine that with great food and a glass of wine well mm, terrific. Mm, the glass of wine unfortunately for me uh, means that yes asleep before you get to the second half I reckon <laughs> that might be the trouble now Rick we're getting sort of to the end of where we've been um, in our interview and I've just enjoyed it so much our time's gone so quickly mm. Now, I, I think the listeners would be familiar that I um, ask a few questions at the end, sort of a little bit of out of left field or not so much. So your first question, Rick, is when have you been most happy, would you say? Look, I've done a lot of travelling in my life and I'm very fortunate and I've got, that's just, just another chapter of my life which is incredible and I've got so many stories there. But I, probably the happiest of my life was when I'm solo travelling, you know, in really remote parts of the world and having adventures and meeting new people and and discovering hidden gems that's that's my that's my joy mm. have that you really got a destination is. that you'd like to go to once the sort of gloves are off at well the... i think I'd, I'd, I'd always go back to italy any day i mean you know i love italy and i've been there a few times and i think i'd always go back there any time you know yes. yeah well they might you might never know. get a good feed yeah. when you're there but you know I, I also like going to countries that you know uh Probably countries that most people wouldn't wouldn't go to as well because right. that's where you find that's when you find the magic. Everyone wants to get off the beaten track, don't yeah, they? They do. yeah, yeah, the exactly. authentic experience. Yes, exactly. exactly. Nothing wrong with that. So we talked about we haven't talked, I guess, too much about your own childhood. But do you think that your priorities have changed since when you were younger? Some, I think. Uh, I've been also fairly single-minded in certain things and certainly with you know with my travel you know I, I love my travel and that hasn't changed except for circumstances like like COVID and so forth certainly with the work that I um, continue to do even though uh, not as much that I would like due to work and so forth but I'm I'm constantly work with my grandparents films I've got a couple of books um, about three ideas I have for books that I want to publish but that's no easy task but I have a lot of research and a lot of material that I've been sort of collating over the years and so I tend to sort of a little bit like my mama I tend to sort of pick something up for a little while and, and do a bit more work to it and smooth out the rough edges and then it gets put down and hopefully I'll pick that up again and, and do a bit more so you know I've, I've got certain projects in my mind that uh, that certainly need attention and so yeah I think so. but some priorities have changed you know maybe probably in the last couple of years I'm thinking about more about longevity and health and uh, and well-being and and all of that and so probably that's more a focus now mm, that's part of getting older unfortunately yeah. oh, just, but also just being mindful of um keeping yourself physically healthy and mentally healthy and all all, all of the above you know because mm. from that everything else works you know if we've got a if we've got an able body and we're 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 We've, we're cognitive then other things will, will flow from that so I'm mindful that it's trying to get a balance and that's I think you know, we always talk about the balance but it's not an easy thing but um, I'm trying to sort of add a few more things to the to the mix mm, that I might that I might have neglected you know in the last uh, 10 years right yeah. yeah for sure striving for the balance so what keeps you up at night then Rick I think um I honestly, um, well, I, I, I could be cheeky, couldn't I? <laughs> but yeah, I, I be cheeky. No, I no, like no, cheeky. no, no. Actually, no. I'm just saying, what keeps me up at night is is probably frustration. I think. I think frustration on not so much lack of achievement, but but, but I guess possibly I'm all I'm I'm a very much um, a task master in that sense that I, I like to see a project finished off in a box ticked off, and if there's something in my mind that that I feel is not getting. Um, 
the credence or the or, or the um, or the work's not getting done, it, it sometimes does sort of play on my mind. So I try not to, to think about that. But I do, I do. I sometimes will be, th- I'll be thinking of all sorts of things. I might be at work and, and, and all these creative ideas will pop into my head. And so it's sometimes I'll, I'll get up at like three in the morning and something will pop into my mind and it might be an idea and I have to quickly write it down. So that's probably what keeps me up at night is, is imagination and dreams. Oh, I like that. That mm. sounds good. Okay, what about this one? If someone gave you an envelope with your date of death, would you open it? Oh, good question. Oh, look. There's Prob- either yes yeah, or probably, no. No, I don't think I would. I don't <laughs> think I would. I think, no, I don't think I would because, yeah, I think you need to live each day or each, each, each week or each year as though it's your last. And I think for me, I, I'm very mindful that, you know, you know, the older I get, that time's disappearing and I've got all my boxes to tick and I've got all my projects that I want to do and so I'm very mindful that I need to just uh, work at that but yeah. maybe if I did open up the envelope I'd, I'd work doubly hard big heart, <laughs> big harder that's right I've only got this but no, much I'm, time. I'm, it's I'm an very, interesting question it's interesting isn't it question. Yeah, it's right. yeah, I didn't yeah, see yeah. that one coming and, I, and I'm not quite sure how to answer that one so probably, <laughs> yes probably yes and no yes yeah probably yes <laughs> I'd steam it open and then exactly. I'd close it, <laughs> close it back exactly. up again how about that yeah. Yeah. now are you a dancing man sometimes so Sometimes. Actually, it, I, I shouldn't say that. I actually really like dancing. Oh, you that's love a dancing? Bit, yeah, I really do, actually. It's a bit of a... I love a man should, who yeah. dances. Yeah, yeah I, love, you know, I love dancing. A lot of blokes yeah. say they, they're not a dancing man. You know? No, I'm a dancing man. Um, okay, what's the song if sometimes, I put it on? Sometimes, I like to, yeah, actually, I really like... Um, I'm going to put this song on and you're going to well, dance. Actually, no, I don't, actually have, I don't actually have a song, but I really like funk, rhythm and blues from the 70s. What more can you dance with with that? Mm. Something that's got a groove, something that's got a beat, something that's got a bit of passion to it. I mean, uh, I guess if I was living in, in Latin America, I'd be doing something completely different. But I secretly am a lover of dance. And I think maybe if I get the chance, one of my little wish lists would be to start, you know, doing dance classes maybe. bit of bit of um yeah, yeah latin just, american yeah, yeah just love yeah. that i'd love it i'd really love it so it's uh, that's a little secret you know a little secret uh, <laughs> well, well, passion of mine that I, I secretly enjoy doing it oh yeah. well that's not so secret anymore that's right yeah. well we've we've had a first here yeah. it's been revealed on yeah, big I think, little small i think dogs. i think about 10 years ago after having a couple of bottles of red wine i remember where i was working i got up on the table and did this floor show for about half an hour and it was quite incredible Mm-hmm. Well, that's something. Have we got any footage of that? That might I, be something. That I wish go. someone had, did take some footage of it and they lost it, unfortunately, because otherwise I, uh, I would have proof of it. <laughs> anyway. All right. My last, no, um, we talk about our guilty pleasures. Yes. Yours is Latin American dancing. Mine is trawling the ro- royal family on Instagram and wasting my time, honestly. Who is your favourite royal and why? Doesn't have to be living, can be dead, doesn't have to be English. Yeah, be... well, actually, she is dead, and uh, it's Princess of Monaco, also known as the beautiful Grace Kelly, who was um, a film actress that uh, was in quite significant films from the early 50s to the mid 50s, and uh, who tragically died in, in, in a car accident, and who married Prince Rainier the Third, Prince mm. of Monaco. And I think, you know, that sort of fits in very well, not only with the the movies and so forth, but also as a royal. That's absolutely perfect. Can Mm. I just ask you, because I often ask people what their favourite celebrity scandal is, so just on the theory that Stephanie was driving the car or Princess Grace was driving the car, what's your theory? Because there was that controversy. Yeah, there was, and I probably don't have an answer for that because um, it could have been possibly Grace. It could have been possibly Grace. But wasn't it um, said that it was Grace, but it was actually Stephanie? Wasn't that the story? I well, can't quite remember I don't know. now. I can't quite remember anyway. Yeah. But it was very tragic. And, and, and she was, apart from being absolutely gorgeous and being, you know, uh, a very, very uh, capable actress, you know, she also, I think she just fitted into that role of being princess straight away. She, It's like she went, well, that's uh, that was a chapter in my life as being an actress. And then she just took on the persona of, of being a humanitarian and a you know and and uh, a loving wife and, and princess you know whereas I think some people would find it very hard to make that transition but she was able because I mean you know she she had the fame and fortune from being in pictures but she was able to just push that aside and go well that was then and this is now mm, well beautiful description and they all loved her you know they they she was loved by many mm, yeah and no doubt she was beautiful mm. and um that's the Peter Pan of never get growing old and never yeah <laughs> you're the um the 
the the luxury of it, I suppose, even though it was so tragic. But Rick... you know, you see her in Catch to Catch a Thief with uh, Cary Grant or uh, Rear Window with Jimmy Stewart. She's just you know she just gorgeous, mesmerising, mesmerising. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that might be one of the first ones. Would that fit into your Rick's flicks? Oh, definitely. I know oh, definitely. I've shown both before. They're both uh, they're definitely due for a repeat. But I've shown those two before. They're great. Okay. Well, yeah. let me know where I can buy tickets because yeah, I definitely. think I'd love to go, sure. come and see it. Have you got a favourite celebrity scandal? Well, it's certainly probably not a celebrity that uh, would be current. But one that comes to mind that there's a bit of a, a connection in the sense, and that's Christopher Skates. And for those who know Christopher Skates, embezzled a lot of money from good willing people here in Australia. He made a lot of money from his, uh, his resorts and also Channel 7. But towards the end of his career, he was in, he realised things were going belly up. But a lot of money was being shuffled off to offshore accounts and so forth. And of course, he ended up uh, uh, escaping to Mallorca and, and dying there at the age of 52. <gasps> after many, many attempts of the Australian government to extradite him back to Australia. But it's interesting because, and so that's the scandal, you know, he, he went off with a lot of money that never was retrieved. But the, the funny connection there is that probably um, in the early 80s, it might have been my, maybe 1980, I was just a, a young boy living here in, in Rangeville, and uh, it was my mother and my grandmother, Elsa Chevelle, who had moved up from Sydney, which I'd forgotten to mention earlier on. And one day, Christopher's case came and visited my grandmother, and he was interested in remaking 40,000 Horsemen because it was, you know, being 1980, it's a lot closer to, you know, to 1940 than we are now. And, and it was always a film that a lot of people wanted to remake and it ended up being remade, but as the Light Horseman, as we all know. But at that time, he wanted to remake it. And uh, after he left, my grandmother said, there's something I don't like about that young man. And this was fairly early on. She said that he seems a little bit too oily, a little bit too smooth. And uh, she said, no, I won't be doing any dealings with him. He seems a bit of a a sharp talker and I remember him he came in the day and he uh, just vague memory of him you know dark hair pinstripe suit and uh, interesting your grandmother was on the money she was on the money she had a, actually she had a very very good uh, judge of character and she could tell if someone was spinning the 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 bs or if they were really right down the level and they were sincere and she was right so rick thank you very much for being my guest on big little small talk today it's just been a wonderful chat with you and hearing all about your grandfather but hearing about your contribution and your mother's contribution to making sure that their legacy is remembered and revered Exactly. No, thank you very much. I know sometimes I can go on a, on, a, on a few tangents, but there's just so much, there's so many different stories and they had such a, a, a big life. But uh, I think, you know, my mother just felt that, uh, you know, their life and their story should be, um, you know, left for future generations. And I should mention that before she passed away back in 2013, she finished this uh, amazing probably maybe 138,000 word biography memoir on Chevelle, which has never been published. And so that's one of also my tasks is to get that one published. It needs to be edited and naturally cleaned up and, and, uh, and so forth. But I think, you know, there'll be things in that book that, that there's a lot that not many people know about because it's really, uh, as I said, it's a biography memoir and it really goes into the nuts and bolts of who they were, why my grandfather made the films that he did and uh, a lot of things from his childhood that then he used later on in life for his films mm, wonderful mm. all right well with that that's terrific we'll we'll say goodbye and um and hopefully see that that memory of your grandparents um and their legacy um published at some stage if we can find a publisher for that yeah I mean, no, it's no, part I'm of australian history no, no, that no, i hope yeah, yeah, yeah it's pretty special is, is never lost mm. so rick chevelle carlson thank you very much thank you That's it for this week. Thanks for joining me on Big Little Small Talk. I hope you can make the time to join me next week. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on your favourite podcast app.